I know it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you our speaker this morning. He is our pastor, our leader. He's one who inspires, he uplifts, he blesses. Please join me in a rousing welcome to the podium of our beloved Reverend Pastor John Scott. Welcome, beloved. I left those out. Good morning, family. Uh, sometimes some naughty thoughts just, you know, but th there you go. I will not be tempted. Get thee behind me, whoever you are. <laughs> it's a joy to add my own words of welcome to you all and to those joining us on the, on the World Wide Web. And a special welcome to our hearts to the Ecumenical Choir. Um, it's so nice to have you. Every, every Tuesday evening, they rehearse over at the Sunday School, so we, I get little dribs and drabs of what they're practicing. And welcome home. Lovely to have you. Um, somebody said, it was actually a Rastafarian gentleman who came off the road one evening when we were walking the labyrinth. And he said, oh, 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 what a place here? I, I said, well, it's, it's a place of worship. And he said, eh? what kind of worship? I said, the worship of love, the worship of joy, the worship of truth. He said, and God too. I said, God is all of the above. So he said, well, tell me about it. And I said, well, here, we honor all paths to God. So it is a special pleasure to have people from all different denominations and faiths share with us here at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living. We're rounding up uh, Child Month in May, and Dr. Anthony Armstrong, who is the author of a book uh, titled Awakening Genius in the Classroom, believes that every child is a genius. To quote Dr. Armstrong, that does not mean that every child can paint like Picasso, compose like Mozart, or score 150 on an IQ test. But every child is a genius according to the original meanings of the word genius, which are to give birth, that's related to the word genesis, and to be zestful or joyous, which, which is related to the word genial. Essentially then, the real meaning of genius is to give birth to the joy that is within each child. Isn't that a lovely thought? Every child is a genius. Can we say together, today I give birth to joy? Can we say that? Today I give birth to joy. You know, a little boy was heard praying, and he said, Lord, if you can't make me a better boy, don't worry about it. I've been having a good time exactly as I am. And I'm not sure if it's the same little boy who opened the big old family Bible, and he was, you know, he was fascinated by the illuminated script, you know, the beautiful um, curlicues and swirls. And so as he was looking through the Bible, his mom said, you know, be careful with that Bible, it's very old. It's older than you, you know, and it's older than me, and it's older than grandma and grandpa. As he was looking through it, something fell out onto the floor. It was a, a, a pressed leaf. You know how you can put a leaf between the pages of a book? So a leaf, a large leaf fell out. And he said, <gasps> so his mother said, why, what, what has happened, what has happened? He said, you won't believe what I found. He, she said, what did you find in the old family Bible? He said, Adam Thut. <laughs> Adam Thut. Now, I have to be politically correct, so I'd like to use uh, for gender equality. So I want to tell you one about a little girl. Um, right here in our Sunday school, as she was coming off the podium, I think Reverend Ann said, why do we have to be quiet in church? She said, because everybody's asleep. <laughs> I don't think it was during one of my encouragements. At least I hope not. But according to Dr. Armstrong, and I quote, each child comes into life with wonder, curiosity, awe, spontaneity, vitality, flexibility, and many other characteristics of a joyous being. As an infant, he says, has twice as many brain connections as an adult. I didn't know that. 
The young child masters a complex symbol system, their own native language, without any formal instructions, and young children have vivid imaginations, creative minds, and sensitive personalities. These youthful traits are highly valued from an evolutionary perspective. The more species evolve, the more they carry youthful traits into adulthood, a process called neoteny or holding youth. That's not holding on to youth. That's holding youth, holding the youthfulness of our thoughts and our minds. It is imperative that we as educators, the doctor says, and parents, help preserve these genius characteristics of children as they mature into adulthood. So those capacities can be made available to the broader culture at a time of incredible change. End of quote. And I think you'll agree this is a time across the globe of incredible change and new conversations about the value of life and the, the truth about our divinity as creations of something so awesome and so beautiful and so joyous that all of us really should be remembering how to give birth to the joy that is intrinsic to our very nature. Many of you may know the story of a man named Norman Cousins who checked himself out of hospital where he had been diagnosed with a serious disease of the connective tissue. Notice the term serious disease. We always put that before anything that we consider to be grave. He checked himself into a hotel room where he watched reel after reel of funny movies and laughed himself back to health. What is amazing about his experience is that he found he had to retrain himself to approach life with joy and laughter because it looks as if as we grow old, and I think we've all had this experience, it gets socialized out of you. You know, it's, it's not proper behavior to have fun, especially not in church, you know. And um, Chicken Mary Hawk Nail, remember that? If you were having too much fun, you got warned that disaster and doom was on the horizon. But so in order to change, Cousins had to step outside of the social expectations that had been his heritage. He started paying attention to what generated life in him rather than to what seemed appropriate from society's perspective. This turned out to be laughter and more of it. And more laughter released more life in him and he was healed. The ancient Greeks classified humans as laughing animals. At the boarding school I attended, a particularly humorless teacher gave me three strokes of his cane because one day when me and my friends were giggling at his expense, he asked, Scott, is there any difference between you and a jackass? So I said, I think so, sir, I, saucily. The fundamental difference between myself and an ass is that donkeys, and I thought to myself, and teachers, uh, only bray, but I can laugh. So he said, bend over, and gave me three strokes of his cane. He said, no, laugh at that. So I did. So he gave me three more strokes. So I said, thank you. I said, sir, this could go on all day. <laughs> Another teacher used to rap me on the knuckles as he passed my desk with his ruler. Listen, bang, bang. I said, what have I done now? He said, it's not what you have done, it's what you're going to do. But you know, friends, if you have ever ventured to tell a joke to your dog or your cat, you will, you will understand that though they, they feel happiness, they don't have a sense of humor. They take everything quite literally. They have no notion of double meaning, clever plays on words, incongruity, absurdity, or tongue-in-cheek humor. Now, if you're an animal lover, you know that they do have a sense of play a big sense of play, but no sense of playing with their existence or with the reality as such. No point in telling my dog, Chicken Mary Hawknear, because he barks at everything that passes and delights in so doing. They don't have the capacity to stand back from themselves and their circumstances enough to develop a sense of humor or perception of the comical or absurd. They just love doing what they love doing. I am told that lion and tiger cubs and other animals can be very playful, and it is thought by animal behaviorists that this is how they learn their life skills. Young monkeys, likewise, can be quite inquisitive and frolicsome, but old monkeys become totally serious. 
all business and no nonsense. We humans, on the other hand, have a capacity for playfulness that can be just as alive at the age 90 as the age nine. One of my favorite golden girls, Betty White, actress Betty White, um, who on January the 17th this year celebrated her 97th birthday, may not be quite as agile on stage as she was in her 20s and 30s, but her imagination, the twinkle in her eye, the playfulness and humor are just as vibrant and lively as ever. Another um, author, Conrad Hires, once said, and I quote, the person who is still able to wink can turn the entire universe upside down. End of quote. Friends, laughter can literally revive the life force within us. The truth is that in the apparently most abysmal existence is nestled a potential for pure joy. In the heart of each of us, the presence of life waits to be nurtured and celebrated. This is not just a hope, it is a reality. And if we judge only by the barren conditions portrayed by the news media, we will overlook life and its seeds of new growth present there. It is when we actually grasp the reality of life's powerful working presence in the midst of our challenges that a kind of holy paradox breaks upon us and we can take a breath, smile, and say, look at me, this is one boy or second boy and have a little chocolate yourself. And the chuckling changes how you feel about everything. The challenge may be there, but so is the healing life behind that little laugh. Such incongruity is really at the heart of humor. We allow ourselves to break out into laughter and life proceeds to do its healing work within us. This is a moment and a feeling that, like no other it is a moment that happened to the biblical characters Abraham and Sarah who discovered they were pregnant to, ha and to have a child when they were 100 years old. Talk about elderly prima gravida. I mean, that's really old. No wonder they named the child Isaac, which is the Hebrew word for laughter. Sarah said in Genesis 21, 6, and I quote, God has made laughter for me, unquote. This is the incredible moment when the desert begins to bloom. When we laugh, something shifts, and life takes on a new meaning, a new light is shed on our circumstances. Genuine laughter is spontaneous. It rolls out of us, sweeping before it our reluctance, making irrelevant our decorum and propriety. Like love, it cannot be demanded. No government can legislate it. No leader can decree it. It is unrehearsed as it flows from us, and perhaps that is why we enjoy it so. Such spontaneity is rare for, for too many of us. We need to give birth to joy and remind ourselves that life can be lived because we want to and not because we have to. You ever heard somebody, if some people, let, when they hear them laughing, you don't know what the joke is, but you start to laugh too. It's like contagious and infectious, uh, and it's wonderful. One of our teenagers a little while ago said to me that I'm the only minister she knows who has a sense of humor. Mark, you don't know many ministers, but um, I always like to give my ministry a like touch. I don't know why we have, we, we have been taught that if, to be profound, you have to use big words and be somber and long-faced and, and take it all very seriously. So I'm so happy for this answer of mind, which has taught me that life is not a funeral march. It is a tune for us to dance to with those that we love and those people that we meet upon life's path. Too much religion has been like that of the old Scottish preacher when a young girl asked if it would be all right for her to take a walk in the woods on Good Friday after she attended church. The preacher thought about it for a while and then said, uh, uh, yes, I think so, it would be all right as long as you don't enjoy it. <laughs> Charles Fillmore, the founder of Unity, once said and I quote, when joy is put back into religion, there'll be more religion in the world.
I am thankful for religious science and that it's a happy religion and that when I come to church, I leave here feeling buoyant and buoyed and uplifted and happy. Jesus taught that God is a loving father and what kind of loving father wants to keep you frightened and unhappy and in perpetual uh, fear of judgment and, and damnation? God sees us from the viewpoint of immortality. And this is what I love about having a sense of humor. The iPad has a way of spell correcting and writing what it thinks you mean to say. And so when I wrote that, God sees us from the viewpoint of immortality, it wrote, God sees us from the viewpoint of immorality. I said, indeed. I love to imagine his gentle laughter within me when I stub my toe on the obstacles I have created for myself in life. I listen within and I hear the laughter of God. And when I join in that laughter, it brings joy to my very existence. The prolific New Thought writer, the late Walter C. Lanyon, in his book, The Laughter of God, writes, and I quote, and I heard the laughter of God in the soul of my very being, ringing in glorious cadence throughout my universe, causing me suddenly to burst into a glorious laughter which was full of praise, full of wonder and amazement at that which I had missed through looking through a glass darkly. Arise, shine, for your light has come, Isaiah 60 verse one. Do you hear? It is wonderful. It is wonderful. It is wonderful. Heaven and earth are full of, of thee. Sin and sickness and death have vanished away in my laughter." End of quote. So this brings me to your assignment. Your mission, should you decide to undertake it, is to make joyous laughter a part of your daily spiritual practice and diet this week. The beautiful Jesus said, and I quote from Luke 6, verse 21, Blessed are you that weep now, for you shall laugh. On end of that scripture. So look for the humorous side of things this week. Place your mouth in the smile position at least three times a day. Look in the mirror and make your lips smile. Let's just have a practice. Put your lips in the smile position. Mr. <laughs> Kintit. It is impossible to remain glum if you put your, your mouth in the smile position. Uh, Ernest Holmes, the founder of our great teaching, on page 290, paragraph 2 of the Science of Mind textbook, recommends that we declare, and let me quote, everything necessary to the full and complete expression of the most boundless expression of joy is mine now. End of quote. So, let me break it down for you and you can say it with me. Everything necessary, together. Everything necessary. To the full and complete expression. To the full and complete expression. Of the most boundless experience of joy. Of the most boundless experience of joy. Is mine now. Is mine now. Me say now. No. Yes. Me say no. Me say no. Me say no. For those listening overseas, me say it means verily, verily, I say unto you. Me say, joy now. Say for me, I am the spirit of joy within me. Today I give birth to joy. And throw your hands in the air and say, it is wonderful. I am not convinced. It is wonderful. I know everything gets out of place, when you? <laughs> and so my friends, in the words of Lanyon, I hear the laughter of God ringing in the deep recesses of your soul. And sometimes I like just to stop and be still for a moment and listen. to the joy that you are giving birth to. Just by being here, just by sharing your consciousness, just by breathing and being what God created you to be. Give birth to joy. Turn to your neighbor and say, push. <laughs> Everything 
necessary to the full and complete expression of the most boundless experience of joy is yours now. Know this, see it, feel it, and be it. Push, you are wonderful. Namaste.